Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gunnar Jakobsson, and I am an infectious disease physician from uh, the hospital in Skövde, Skarper Hospital in Western Sweden. And I'm also chairman of the Regional Antibiotic Committee, and I'm also a member of the Strama organization. Do you know Strama? One hand up. Oh, not so many. Strama, the strategic program against antibiotic resistance. But I'm not going to talk so much about Strama today. Free, uh, free to ask questions during the lecture, but I'm a little bit deaf, so if you ask questions, do it with a high and clear voice, and maybe I can answer you. Okay. This is the agenda, and it's... Uh, a huge topic, and I would just highlight some things about uh, higher rates of morbidity and mortality with escalating resistant rates, different resistant settings in the world, with especially troublesome pathogens, even as sensitive, but even more as resistant pathogens, uh, alternative to antibiotic therapy, need for more and for faster diagnostics, and for patients being carriers or colonized with resistant organisms, this is a psychological trauma, it's a stigma, I will talk a little bit about that. A uh, very important distinction between colonization and infection, ESPL, I think we can say the biggest problem uh, in resistance nowadays, and empiric and definitive antibiotic therapy. I will explain these principles, precaution of over suspicion of resistance and over treatment and thereby enhancing the resistance even more, risk factors for resistant infection, severity and kind of infection, not all bacterial infection should be treated with antibiotics, and in times of escalating resistance rate, what should patients or parents and physicians ask for questions when there is maybe an antibiotic treatment. Uh, I will quote uh, WHO uh, Global Action Plan 2015, and this plan is very important. It says that every country must have surveillance programs for antibiotic resistance and for antibiotic use. But in many countries, there are no surveillance systems working. But they say here, and they summarize, I think, very good the problem with resistance. When microbes become resistant to medicines, the options for treating the diseases they cause are reduced. And I will come back and give example of these things. This resistance to antimicrobial medicines is happening in all parts of the world for a broad range of microorganisms with an increasing prevalence that threatens human as well as animal health. And the topic for my lecture, the direct consequences of infection with resistant microorganisms can be severe, including longer illnesses, increased mortality, prolonged stays in hospital, loss of protection for patients undergoing surgery and other medical procedures, and of course, increased costs. And antimicrobial resistance affects all areas of health, involves many sectors, and has impact on the whole of society. I think this is all about the course you are going. But I will talk about clinical uh, consequences. 
And what about increased mortality? This is an old report from uh, 2009. It's from ECDC, European Center for Disease Control. And it estimates that 25,000 Europeans die each year because of a resistant infection and to a huge cost. But I will point out that there are very uncertain figures. And after this, you can say first report, there have been uh, many more reports and with even higher figures, but there are still very uncertainties about how many dying or will die in resistant infection. But of course, there's increased mortality. All parts of the world, this picture I've taken from Pondicherry in the south of India in Tamil Nadu. And the south of India is a hot spot for antibiotic resistance. And when you talk about clinical consequences, you must be aware of which country, which setting you are discussing. Are you discussing uh, a setting with high or low burden of infection? Are you uh, discussing uh, a rich or a poor country? And how are the rates of resistance? Here's just some examples of high resistance settings from Africa and Asia and how it affects uh, children. And what you see, these countries have a high burden of infections. They have a poor resources. They can, cannot afford second line, third line combination therapy. So uh, direct clinical consequences are increased mortality for the most vulnerable uh, patients as very small children. And in the world, there is an uneven distribution of antibiotics, even without uh, resistance. And uh, among children with pneumonia, there is an under-treatment with antibiotics. And antibiotic resistant adds on this under-treatment with fewer options. I hope you are aware of the main cause behind resistant development. It is antibiotic use. Either if you use antibiotics proper or improper, the antibiotic use leads to antibiotic resistance. But at the same time, when we think there are overuse of antibiotics and improper use for some indication for some diseases, there are under-treatment. So you must keep this in your mind at the same time. Yeah, so when we discuss uh, resistance, which setting are we discussing? which part of the world, country, region within a large country, city, countryside, and in the city, are we discussing the situation in my hospital or other hospitals? Are we discussing the uh, situation in outpatient settings or in primary care? Because there are different resistance rates and you have to act different. And even in my hospital, we have departments with different resistance rates. The intensive care unit, it's a hotspot for a resistance. And there is a quite different situation compared to other departments or wards. I will talk a little uh, bit about uh, a resistant staphylococcus I understand you have different backgrounds, but you have had some lectures, basic lecture about bacteria. 
And this map is, again, from the organization ECDSA, European Control for Disease Control, and it shows the percentage in blood of resistant staphylococci. And the color match more red, the more higher resistant of uh, staphylococci. And you can see a north-south ratio, and even you can see a west-east ratio. Of course, when you act as a medical doctor or physician, it's quite different. If you're working as <laughs> me, in the small town Shövde, in our low resistant setting, still low resistant setting, compared with Romania, Bucharest. You will have to treat and uh, suspect and diagnose very different. Have you problems uh, seeing the pictures or the details? Uh, just tell me them, yeah. Okay. Where the setting and also uh, how old the data are. Again, we look at Europe and this is again resistant staphylococci, methicillin, resistant staph aureus, MRSA. And we compare here two years, 2007 and 2013. And you see for uh, some countries it's been worse, Romania, more red, higher resistant rates. But if you look at uh, Great Britain, France and Spain, it's better. And this is a very important lesson. Resistant rates are reversible. If you act, you can reduce resistant rates. Remember that. Okay. Uh, so you must have updated uh, resistance data. And this is just to point out the huge work achieved by many in Britain, France and Spain. And the cause of this uh, progress uh, in these three countries are two, infection control, infection control programs uh, aiming at people not contracting uh, resistant pathogens. That's one part, infection control program. And the other is um, my topic, proper antibiotic use. Both the total antibiotic use and also restricting antibiotics with a special resistant driving force. Okay, here we have my local data from Western Sweden. And it's about, again, a resistant Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus. And here we have divided uh, the resistant uh, um, uh, for primary care in Swedish, Vård Central, and for hospital. And this is different uh, ant antibiotics. And to the left you see MRSA. And you can see uh, several things at uh, this cartoon. We have le very low uh, resistant rates, very low incidence of MRSA, 1-2%. And you see, if you compare primary care and hospital care, it's different, but in general we have higher resistant rates in the hospital. But when you work uh, at a primary care health uh, center, you think a little bit different if you work in an intensive care unit at a big hospital. And this is again MRSA resistance to and in 2015 we had a huge increase and this was mostly with people contracting the resistance abroad, outside Sweden. And you know we had uh, a huge migration in uh, 2015. So we have statistics on 
where uh, the resistance is contracted. Okay, even if you're not a uh, medical doctor, you can uh, probably see there's a signs of infection. This is the left hand. Um, and you see redness, you see swellness, and you see pus, this infected secretion. Well, it should be uh, an infection, but which bacteria? I can tell because I'm used to it, but I don't uh, think you can say. But maybe you could suspect this is an ordinary, uh, not ordinary, but it's a Staphylococcus aureus. But we have to have a culture for, to know for sure. Even I need a culture. I can, I can suspect, but I need a culture to be sure. And in this case, it was a resistant uh, staphylococci, and then I need a resistance testing. I don't know why. I must have a culture and a resistant testing of antibiotics. Then I know it's a resistant staphylococci. You are with me? Yeah. And <laughs> here is a special thing. This bacteria contain a toxin, a toxic molecule, it's called Panton valentin levcocytin, and this is uh, causing a very serious infection, especially when young people have it in their lungs and so on. In this case, it uh, went well, I can say, but this is a marker of a potential uh, very serious infection. Uh, no, no, uh, but we don't uh, know for how long. If we have a patient with a resistant bacteria, we follow up and we take cultures, but that this wound uh, will heal and we don't, uh, we don't have any possibility to culture this wound, but we culture from different sides of the body because we know there are uh, other places and we follow the patients. I will come back uh, to that, but we don't think it's very pessimistic to say to the patient, you will be a carrier for all your life, you should never do that, but I don't think that it's, it's not the case. Okay. You know, for the most part of the human history, we had no antibiotics. How did we cure these infections? Of course, with knife, some surgery, we can say with a drainage procedure. And what about this old uh, therapy? Just drain it with a knife, if you compare it with a knife plus an antibiotic. Well, this very recent study from the US, 2016, compared knife with knife and antibiotic and this special antibiotic trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole, and it was mostly MRSA. And, well, antibiotic plus knife is a little bit better than just knife, but I think only the knife's doing fine. If you look here, Placebo, it's only the knife and per protocol. Well, 86% of the patient did uh, get cured by the, only the knife. And some more was cured, not 3% with antibiotics. Maybe you can abstain in the first place antibiotics and only give antibiotics to these not being cured by the knife. And this is a more uh, option now in times with escalating resistant rates. Okay, I go back to my patient. And in the medieval time, when I didn't know about Staphylococci or other bacteria, they called this pus, pus bonum and laudibile, the good, the praiseworthy, uh, pus. And why is that so? Because they did know it was easy to drain this infection. As this study from 2016 from the US, they knew in the medieval time. Uh, but there is a different infection 
for example, streptococci, and the pus from streptococci, we say dishwater-like. It's not so easy to drain, and it was not called pus, pus bonum and laudibile. Yeah, abstain antibiotics in uncomplicated infection. Of course, both the patient and physician should ask that question. And use, of course, if possible, other treatment options. And this is uh, another uh, patient. It's a diabetic patient. It's very common for diabetic patients to have foot infections. And this is, uh, I, I, I hope I don't upset anyone with this uh, picture. It's the left uh, foot and it's been some toes amputated and there's a wound and we sometimes not at my department so much are using this larvae of the green butterfly Lucilia sericata. I must look because I don't know the name. I forget that. But you should always think about alternative treatments. And of course, as I said, diagnostics needed culture. And in our times, more uh, diagnostics, more culture and non-culture techniques are needed. Yes. So this MSSA, that's uh, methicillin sensitive staphorus, that's sensitive staphorus. And this development to more resistant staphylococci, we say we have problems with sensitive staphylococci causing a wide array of infections. But the problems with MRSA is more like a disaster. And this is a very old paper from 1941. It's about very serious staphylococci infections in the blood, a bacteremia. And it describes 122 cases. And 1941, not every patient uh, could, uh, could get antibiotics. Some get. It was in the beginning clinical era of antibiotics, 1940-41. And what was the outcome for these patients? Well, 82% died. And maybe we are going back. We are slowly going back to the pre-antibiotic era if we cannot use our first line or second line antibiotics. And then we will face this huge uh, death rate. We hope not. The patient's perspective of MRSA uh, is obvious. They c uh, could face increased morbidity, increased mortality, increased length of stay in the hospital, increased length of therapy and maybe a therapy with second line or third line treatment with more side effects and the psychological trauma of being a carrier or colonized with a resistant uh, pathogen. And we think like that. We have so-called notification cards. Uh, you are a carrier because we don't want the patient to spread these uh, pathogens to other patients, so every contact with healthcare there should show this notification card. But of course, it's not uh, nice for them to show this. And we have several examples when patients don't show this, don't say anything. And it can have consequences. Many, many patients feel dirty and they, they Use themselves for this shameful uh, condition. I have a lot of patients with MRSA, 
what I most do is not to worry them about this uh, bacterium. That's my main topic, uh, topic when I meet these patients. Yeah, and a lot of studies, papers have described this stigma to have a resistant uh, or to be a carrier. But regarding your questions, many patients get rid of uh, their resistant pathogens and we can also offer them uh, treatments. But some patients with risk factors, they are colonized years after years, so it's uh, not so easy for them. Yeah, here's uh, figures about mandatory reportable uh, resistant in Sweden. We have a lot of resistant, but not every resistant is mandatory to report to the public health agency of Sweden. But here you can uh, see MRSA and you see uh, the increase in 2016. Uh, we'll come back and talk about ESBL, uh, the gram negative, the biggest problem. And you also see uh, to the left pneumococci we don't think there's a big problem in Sweden with resistant pneumococci. And you see also here is vancomycin resistant enterococci causing outbreaks in special hospital departments. But we don't think uh, this is a big problem compared to ESBL. And when you look at these figures, what do they say? You should be aware of this is a mixture of people with an active infection and people, quite healthy people, just carriers. For ESBL, there can be carriers in the gut. We take a feces sample as a screening and we find uh, a resistant ESBL, but they are healthy, they have no symptoms, or they can have the bacteria in the urine. So you must also always be a little bit critical of these figures, how many are carriers and how many are really representing infection. I did say that uh, it's the most common uh, site is the uh, anterior nares. So in here I can see maybe five or six people with staphylococci in the nose. I will not uh, say, <laughs> but I, I can notice some risk factors. No, it's a <laughs> That's not a topic for the course, I think. But, uh, uh, but we can, as I said, we can eradicate uh, 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 some in in some uh, certain conditions, and uh, we are, uh, for example, uh, if a carrier is undergoing elective surgery, an operation, that uh, will will not we don't want a post-operative infection with MRSA, and then we can treat before. Okay, now the big problem uh, with ESPL. Uh, extended spectrum beta lactamase, it's so called gram negative bacteria with this enzyme conferring resistance to a broad array of antibiotics, penicillin, cephalosporins, and in some cases also carbapenems. And this is again a map of Europe from ECDC and showing the percentage of resistant gram-negative bacteria in the blood. And you see the same ratio from the north to the south and from west to east. And of course, if you're acting in the healthcare, you must know your resistant rates. Yeah, you see this large uh, part here, 2016. And uh, gram-negative bacteria uh, colonize uh, the gut. 
and urine, and they can be completely asymptomatic, no problems whatsoever. And these bacteria are causing a wide spectrum of infections, urinary tract infections, abdominal infections, and very severe infections like sepsis, uh, bloodstream infection, severe sepsis, and infections contracted in the hospital, we call them nosocomial, in opposite to community acquired infection, this ordinary infection contracted in the community, and infections in immune compromised. So these ESPL are everywhere <laughs> nowadays. And I will tell you a short case report, and this is a published uh, uh, case report. So I will not uh, disclose any patients, uh, so it's been published. And this is uh, about a doctor, medical doctor, a 60-year-old uh, doctor working in a university hospital. His problem with the liver, and he's yawned it, he's yellow. And then we know it could be obstruction for the bile from the liver. And uh, these, uh, he's undergoing an uh, examination. I don't, I don't think you know it, but it's, uh, the rationale is, is there obstruction for the bile? You put an endoscope down the stomach, down the small intestine, and up the common bile duct if you see if it's an ob obstruction. It's a routine examination. It's performed every day in every hospital many times. But this time, the patient falls ill some hours afterwards with fever and chills and uh, suspicion of infection. And this is not so uncommon. We see this uh, sometimes. And he's treated for an infection in the common bile duct with a broad spectrum penicillin intravenously. And we take blood culture from the blood and it grows Escherichia coli. It's the common gram-negative bacteria in the gut. It's very common. But there are no improvement in three days. And then comes the answer from the resistant testing is ESPL, E. coli. So, of course, there is a change of treatment to an even more broad-spectrum antibiotic. We call it carbapenem. You can say it's the last resort, uh, really, of antibiotics. And he stays in hospital for 10 days after this routine examination. Okay. Six weeks later, the wife is admitted to the hospital, but his, uh, sh uh, she has no problem with the liver. She has problem with a suspicion of a kidney infection nephritis to the same hospital and she is treated with broad spectrum antibiotic and new improvement and they use an even more broad spectrum antibiotic simiropenem that's a carbapenem and they do an ultrasound of the liver and they see pus in the liver so it's abstracted urine and it's very painful, this condition. You can imagine uh, if you cannot have the urine out. So they put in a catheter and drain, again, drain the infection with this catheter. And what about the culture? It's E. coli, ESPL, and the same as the husband. And the woman gets uh, treatment for 14 days with this very broad spectrum antibiotics. And I should say that ordinary infections, pyronephritis, we often treat as outpatient settings. The patient's not in hospital, and we treat them with peroral uh, therapy for mainly seven days. So you can compare, if you have a resistant infection, how it affects the length of stay and the length of therapy. And this is just to really prove that these are the exactly the same strain between uh, 
the husband and the wife. And the title of this study is Dissemination of Extended Spectrum Beta Lactamase Producing Azure Recycle at Home, a Potential Occupational Hazard for Healthcare Workers. I'm married, and so far my wife has not contracted any ISP. <laughs> Okay, implication of uh, more ESPL, of course, increased morbidity, increased mortality, increased need for uh, admission to hospital, length of stay, length of treatment, need for isolation and infection control, need for rapid and accurate diagnosis, and a lot of information to worried patients. Now, uh, what about antibiotic therapy? You are not medical doctors, uh, so I will explain uh, about antibiotic therapy. We talk about empiric uh, therapy when we suspect an infection, but we have no culture proving of the pathogen, and we have no resistant testing. And we have definite therapy. We know the exact bacteria, and we know the resistance testing results. But over 95% of all therapies worldwide are empiric. We face the situation, we guess. We guess, we guess the pathogen and we guess the resistant uh, test. We should be aware of that. And an example from Sweden. This is pneumonia contracted in the community. It's an ordinary pneumonia, and it's the etiology which bacteria causing the pneumonia. And in Sweden, this is patients with pneumonia cared for in infectious disease department, like me, in Sweden. So the, uh, these are specialized departments for caring for patients with pneumonia. And this uh, pie chart shows the distribution of different bacteria. And you see one bacteria causing nearly uh, two-thirds of the pneumonia cases. And when I have medical students, I ask which bacteria, but I don't ask you that. But we can see it's the well-known bacteria called unknown <laughs> in two two-thirds, we don't know. And these are specialized departments in Sweden. Of course, the most common, 15% is pneumococci, as you should guess, but, and here in the 66%, it can be, it was no pneumonia, it was a completely different condition. It was caused by virus, it was caused maybe by pneumococci or other. And of course, we must have more diagnostics and fast diagnostics, especially in times with escalating resistance. So you can uh, say that with our uh, antibiotic treatment, we're chasing the pathogen, and sometimes we're lucky, but sometimes not. But if we have a culture with a resistant testing, well, it's a little bit easier. Okay, what about over suspicion and over uh, treatment? The hospital and the healthcare must sometimes suspect the patients gotten resistant infection. But we can't do that every time. If we always suspect a resistant infection, the consequence will be we use a lot of broad-spectrum antibiotic and we will enhance the resistant situation. So we must reserve this suspicion when it's needed. But on the other hand, we can't ignore too much the suspicion. It will end in the death of the very severely ill patients. So we must have the balance. And what can help us? Well, you must know the resistant rates and the pattern in general, even if you don't have 
this individual patient's result in front of you. You must be aware of the general resistance rates and of your local resistance rates. And this is a shortage in many countries in the world. There's a lack of uh, uh, resistance and culture results, I guess. Okay, risk factors for these gram-negative bacteria like uh, ESBL. Well, uh, different catheters, but a urinary catheters, some diseases which have an immunodepressing or immunocompromising effect like diabetes mellitus or malignancy, recent antibiotic therapy, all antibiotic therapy select in your gut resistant organism and if you're unlucky you will be a carrier of a resistant bacteria you don't know hospitalization of course there is a spread of resistant organism in the hospital especially in uh, our ICU intensive care unit and prolonged hospitalization and traveling to high risk settings, of course, but these are not very clinically useful risk factors. We talk about the predictive value of knowing how much risk one risk factors are confirmed to patient. We don't know. And this is a huge debate among clinical doctors, among uh, researchers to come true with an algorithm or useful clinical risk factor we don't have it today. You should be aware of the distinction between complicated and not complicated infections. And if you have a situation with high resistance rates, you will have non-appropriate therapy. It will have different consequences if you have a urinary tract infection, skin and soft tissue infections, while you will uh, have a longer illness, increased morbidity, but you will not die. But if you have a very severe infection, you are in the risk for dying. And again, what will help us? more diagnostics. So, maybe I'm getting to the end before, and with before I mean when we had rather low rates of resistant. You do know that the first resistant pathogens occurring early in the 40s, soon after antibiotics, uh, were introduced, but where we have low rates of resisting, it was mostly a risk for the society when the use of antibiotics uh, escalated. You have this scenario, you have selection of resistant bacteria in the intestinal flora of the antibiotics used, and it's easier for new bacteria to colonize, and these resistant bacteria can spread the hospital and in the community. But the patient think this will not happen to me. It's so uncommon. I am not in risk for this. I can use antibiotic. It will no problem. But that's before. Nowadays we say to the patient we say it's also a risk for the individual and as the case report for the family to use antibiotics when not needed. There have always been side effects to antibiotics that are not new but maybe the more side effects if we use second third line and combination therapies and so on. We have the same scenario with selection of resistant bacteria in the intestinal flora it's easier for new bacteria to colonize the gut. And if that individual gets an infection in the following weeks, months, years, maybe it will be with a resistant bacteria. 
So now it's a risk for the individual patient. It's not only for the society. And this is an example you must have heard of. You can read it in the newspaper. It's a fashion to make studies like these nowadays. You have uh, people traveling abroad and you want to examine their faces, a faces uh, sample before they're going abroad and coming home and then you uh, examine the faces uh, again and you see they uh, become carriers of resistant uh, pathogens. And you see here the percentage of uh, travelers contracting a resistant organism to different countries. We don't know for how long, maybe for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. It differs among different studies, but most patients will get rid of these uh, gut colonizing bacteria in six or nine months, but some have them after 12 months or 18 months. And now the patient is concerned. <laughs> so you, we use it when we discuss with a patient with a not so severe infection, maybe we should abstain. And this is of course most important in primary care with not so severe infection. It's different when you have a patient in our intensive care unit. Okay, previously we always talked about the distinction between virus and bacteria. Antibiotics, new effect uh, on virus, of course. But now we talk about bacteria and bacteria. Not every bacteria should be treated. And this is partly new knowledge, new evidence during the maybe last 15, 10 years. And you must think of the consequences of the disease uh, if you're not treated properly with antibiotics. And this is a very severe infection. Of course, we use antibiotics, meningitis, uh, sepsis, bloodstream infection, uh, pneumococci, and pneumonia, uh, severe uh, erysipelas, it's a skin infection, and pyonephritis, it's a kidney infection. Of course we use it. Uh, and then, yeah. while maybe you can see less complications with antibiotics, for uh, example, Borrelia infections, sexually transmitted infection, ear infection in a very small children, and some wound infection. Uh, and then we're getting to uh, some uh, diseases, conditions, where we see we're affecting the symptoms as urine cystitis and tonsillitis in the truth. And then we're getting to some conditions we are not sure, or it's a small effect of antibiotic sinusitis and with non-severe tonsillitis. Then, of course, there are several uh, conditions with a new effect of antibiotics, but antibiotics are used a lot. Upper airway infections, tonsillitis without this Streptococcus pyogenes, bronchitis. Bronchitis is a very common to get an uh, antibiotic prescription because the cough is so long lasting. It could uh, last for two or three weeks and the patient thinks this can't be right. I've been so ill for several weeks. But regardless of the pathogen, if it's virus or bacteria, a very small effect of antibiotics. Cough of course and uh, ear infection in older children. Now I think I'm ready for this last question. You should uh, ask if you are a physician. In case of a, a, a suspicion of an infection, is antibiotic needed? And of course, again, this is most actual in 
outpatient setting in primary care, not in the hospital. Can you use alternative treatment, drainage? And you should think about the severity of infection. And we have a lot of guidelines nowadays. You should be aware of the guidelines. And we have a lot of smartphone applications with very easy to be updated with actual guidelines. And which diagnostic work allowed to use? Of course, you should know now, I think we should have cultures and resistance testing. And the physician should ask, is a resistant infection possible or probably? Because sometimes he don't want to wait for the result of the culture or the resistant test, he want to start immediately. So he must decide if to suspect a resistant infection or not. And in case of antibiotic use, again, additional treatment, drainage, and we call it control of the focus or the source of infection. And of course, the choice of antibiotics and uh, duration. And it's also uh, important for the patient or the parent, for a children patient, should ask, is antibiotics needed? And patients do nowadays, especially in primary care. And parents do ask for the children, is it really a, a need for antibiotics in this condition? Alternative or additional treatment the choice and side effects of uh, antibiotics and uh, duration. So, the agenda, these are some small uh, parts of the clinical consequences of a uh, resistant uh, organism. Okay, then uh, I think we'll thank you and take Pause and you can ask questions during the break. Thank you.